Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is David Thoreau, and I'm the president of the Independent Institute. I'm delighted to welcome you all to our event this evening. Um, as many of you know, we regularly hold the uh, series of lectures, debates, and seminars called the Independent Policy Forum here at our conference center in Oakland. Tonight, our program is entitled The Frankenfood Myth, Politics and Protests of the Biotech Revolution. And we're very pleased to be featuring the book of the same title called The Frankenfood Myth by uh, uh, one of our speakers, Henry Miller, who I'll introduce in a minute. Um, it's a very unusual book. Uh, anyone interested in uh, genetically altered foods and the whole subject of biotechnology, I highly recommend it. For those of you who are new to the Institute, um, hopefully you got our registration packet. It includes uh, information about our books. There's also a flyer on tonight's event. And uh, you'll find on the flyer at the bottom of the front side information about uh, our next event, which will be held on uh, Tuesday, January 31st. And it's entitled, Eminent Domain, Abuse of Government Power. Those of you familiar with the recent Supreme Court Kelo decision will know that it's caused quite a bit of uproar for obvious reasons. That particular event will, will feature two speakers, one whose name is Stephen Greenhut, who's a senior editorial writer from the Orange County Register and author of the book Abuse of Power, How Government Misuses Eminent Domain. The other speaker is Timothy Sandifer, who's a staff attorney at the Pacific Legal Foundation in Sacramento. He's also a past Garvey Fellow for the Institute. Um, more specifically, for those of you who are new to the Institute, the Independent Institute is a scholarly public policy research institute. We sponsor studies by leading scholars on major social and economic issues. The results were published as books. We also produce a quarterly journal called the Independent Review. This is the current issue, uh, which is available also upstairs. And we um, do many other things. Uh, we have fellowship programs for students. We hold summer seminars. Um, those of you who do not receive our weekly email newsletter called The Lighthouse, you're welcome to do so by leaving us with your email address. We also notify people of upcoming events that way and also um, when we have people on national television and other developments. One thing I also want to point out, one of our books is worth noting, which is this one called The Poverty of Reason. Uh, it's a critical look at the issue of uh, sustainable development and the precautionary principle, which relates to our topic tonight. It's by an Oxford economist by the name of Wilfred Beckerman. And uh, for those of you who are interested in that topic, that's something that you might want to consider. So for tonight's program, um, there's a lot of controversy, including in California, about this topic. And uh, we thought it would be well worthwhile inviting two scientists who are well versed in many of the key issues that pertain to it. For most of uh, mankind's history, millennia, quite frankly, farmers all over the world have bred crops for their resistance to pests and disease, uh, nutritional value. Uh, within the last century or so, scientists have used an increasingly number of sophisticated methods for modifying crops at the genetic level. Of course, Mendel was one of the key scientists who developed the the science of genetics. But only since the 1970s have advances in gene splicing and other aspects of biotechnology up the ante, so to speak, with the, prom the promise of dramatically improved agricultural products, more resistant, more nutritional, and so on. Uh, but few topics have generated the kind of not just local but international controversy, fear, and uh, perhaps misinformation. Public resistance in certain places is intense. Uh, it's fueled by fear. Uh, the question is, are the fears justified? And uh, as I mentioned, part of the, the rationale for this is what's called the precautionary principle. Are the risks too high? Uh, many people believe they are. The interesting thing about this is that many people not only believe the risks are too high, but many believe that it's too risky to even find out what the risks are. 
So to proceed with our, our program, I'm very delighted to introduce our first speaker, uh, who's author of the book I mentioned. Henry Miller is Senior Research Fellow at the Hoover Institution at Stanford. He's co-author with Gregory Conco of The Franken Food Myth. Dr. Miller joined the, the Food and Drug Administration in 1979. He served in a number of posts involved with the new biotechnology that was developing at that time. He was a medical reviewer for the first genetically engineered drugs evaluated by the FDA and was instrumental in the uh, rapid licensing of ins human insulin and human growth hormone. He served in several posts, including special assistant to the FDA commissioner with responsibility for biotechnology issues. From 1989 to 1994, he was also the founding director of the FDA's Office of Biotechnology. So I'm very pleased to introduce Henry Miller. Thank you very much, David. I, I'm delighted to be here uh, to follow in the footsteps of uh, glitterati who have uh, spoken here uh, before. Uh, but I, it, it's particularly gratifying uh, tonight to share the podium with Bruce Ames, uh, who has the distinction of being a world-class scientist who has made signal contributions to science in several fields, uh, who's been an astute commenter on public policy issues related to science for as long as I can remember, uh, and who is also a true gentleman. Um, let me begin by reading a, a brief excerpt uh, from the be very beginning of the Frankenfood myth, several paragraphs. Imagine a situation in which an impoverished developing country suffering severe food shortages in the midst of a year-long drought receives food aid shipments of grain from industrialized nations to help fill the void. Instead of saving the day, though, the food aid sits untouched in warehouses. Grain that could help prevent malnutrition in millions of people is locked away from starving villagers by government edict because it contains kernels of the same gene-spliced, genetically improved corn varieties consumed daily by scores of millions of Americans and others around the world but that allegedly have not been, quote unquote, proven to be safe. Eventually, starving citizens actually storm the warehouses to liberate the grain. If it weren't real, this scenario would be almost too implausible to believe, especially in the 21st century. Yet this was precisely the situation in the southern African countries, Zambia and Zimbabwe, during fall, fall and winter of 2002-2003. So this is where the new biotechnology, variously known as recombinant DNA technology, gene splicing, or genetic modification, applied to agriculture finds itself after more than 20 years of stunning scientific and commercial achievements. We've had more than two decades of widespread pre-commercial and commercial cultivation of environment-friendly, enhanced productivity crops, including more than 100 million acres annually for most of the last decade. And yet the new biotech remains widely misrepresented and beleaguered by anti-technology and anti-globalization activists, poorly defended by its own practitioners and discriminated against in public policy. So that sort of capsulizes um, the subject of the book uh, and the, this, the topic of my remarks tonight. Um, before I go on, let me uh, define some terminology for you, since sometimes it's confusing. Genetic modification is a very generic, general term uh, that simply means any intentional alteration to the genomes of living organisms, and that can be accomplished in a number of ways, old and, and new. It can be done by applying selection pressure over repeated generations. Uh, and selecting for certain desired characteristics. It can be accomplished by hybridizing uh, two different but related organisms or uh, through intentionally mutating an organism's DNA with radiation or, or, or toxic chemicals. Uh, it can also be accomplished, uh, which is the basis of our, uh, our being here tonight, by molecular techniques 
highly precise techniques that splice new genes into an organism's genome. And these can be from another source. They can be uh, genes that have been, in effect, synthesized, uh, DNA made to order, if you will. Um, gene splicing or recombinant DNA technology is the prototype of molecular techniques for genetic modification, often to move single or at most a few genes from one place into another. And the purpose is to uh, create discrete, precise genetic changes that are desired for some reason, for research purposes uh, or for uh, commercial purposes of many kinds. The classic paper which first described functional recombinant DNA, so-called because DNA was being combined or in the scientific jargon recombined uh, from two different sources in a way that it was uh, still functional, appeared in 1973. Since then, the seminal policy question surrounding this new technology and the products derived from it has been, should regulation focus on the characteristics of a given product or on the use of a certain process, gene splicing, uh, of genetic modification? And this has raised some corollary questions. Uh, is the use of gene splicing techniques per se risky? Does the use of these techniques affect product safety in a systematic way that warrants a, a special or sui generis uh, oversight regime for all products made with them? In other words, with respect to safety issues, or for that matter, almost anything else, are gene spliced organisms and products meaningful categories? Um, another question is, um, what is the context of gene spliced crops and foods compared to other similar products made with other techniques? Now, th these are, uh, have been pivotal questions uh, for a long time, and in a vacuum, uh, if we had never carried out genetic improvement uh, before, they could have been difficult questions to answer. But fortunately, science, uh, common sense, and a long history of sophisticated agriculture offer answers to many of these questions. Now, uh, David Thoreau, in his uh, introduction, alluded to controversy uh, over um, much of, of this subject. But um, uh, I would say, and most other uh, uh, scientific commenters would say, that this is largely pseudo-controversy. Um, you're all from the, the Bay Area, I assume, and so you know uh, the old saying that uh, the three most important aspects of, of real estate are location, location, and location. And uh, the corresponding uh, axiom for public policy is that the three most important aspects of it are context, context, and context. And let me give you some examples of what I mean by that, because uh, once again, we are not operating in a vacuum. These are not products uh, that were brought back uh, from Jupiter by a space shot and that are fundamentally uh, uh, fundamentally and basically different from what we've done and what we've seen and what we've grown and what we've eaten previously. Genetic modification, again considered uh, generically, is so ubiquitous in agriculture and food production that the term is almost meaningless. Virtually all major crops grown in the United States have been modified by one technique or another. Uh, and so it's not nature that gave us products like seedless grapes and seedless watermelon, uh, tangelos, well, uh, the, the uh, hybrid of a, a tangerine and grapefruit, or the pluie, uh, a hybrid of plum and apricot, the, the latter having been um, uh, concocted first by a farmer in San Jose, in fact. Um, but it's, uh, it's plant breeding, often very laborious, uh, very much trial and error, uh, very slow, uh, that has given us these products. Uh, and, uh, and many of them have been uh, extremely useful and sometimes even revolutionary, but, but using uh, older, less precise, precise crude techniques. Now, as I alluded to a moment ago, Gene splicing is considered, certainly by the scientific community, to be an extension or refinement 
an improvement over the kind of genetic modification that we've done for a very long time. Um, another um, important point of context is that the, the scientific consensus is extremely clear that the vast experience with gene spliced organisms for food, fiber, and other products over more than 20 years uh, shows a stunning record of environmental and food safety. Uh, a record, uh, I hasten to add, that is hardly evident from the coverage in the media and, um, and from the, uh, the bleeding of activists uh, whenever there's a new advance or, or a new proposal. Um, uh, it's also uh, evident that, uh, that this con scientific consensus has not diffused uh, to uh, as much of the public as we would like. If you look at the record of the anti-biotech <coughs> referendum, uh, referenda items in California, as many of you know, uh, only last month, Sonoma County voted down uh, a ban on uh, gene spliced crops, cultivation for research purposes, for experimental, experimental purposes, or uh, for commercial use. But 45% of voters voted to impose the ban, uh, which is far, far uh, too many for comfort. And uh, three California counties, Mendocino, Marin, and Trinity, where, wherever that might be, um, ha have indeed imposed bans uh, on, on um, gene-spliced crops for, for any purpose. And we can talk later uh, about, about the implications of, of that. Um, uh, places like Marin uh, are, are not big agricultural areas, of course, but uh, ex except it is known for uh, its fruits and nuts. But, um, but, um, uh, but it, it as a as a symbolic act, uh, it's important. Uh, it's antisocial and it's undesirable. Um, another point of context, it, context is that very few new conventionally modified plants or other organisms, such as microorganisms for food production, undergo any kind of regulatory review before they're tested and marketed. And this is something that not many people know. Uh, and, you, and this is reflected in, uh, in surveys that are taken by groups like Greenpeace and um, the Pew um, the Pew Initiative on uh, Food and Biotechnology and so on. Because if, if you ask somebody whether um, a, a genetically engineered food, uh, whether frankenfood should be uh, guaranteed safe by the FDA before people are permitted to eat it, of course they'll say yes. It's like asking people uh, whether uh, pederasts should be banned from teaching in the public schools. Uh, people don't understand the context of how uh, food safety is currently assured. Um, in spite of, of this context about food regulation, gene spliced plants and the foods from them are subjected to a case by case review, uh, often by multiple regulatory agencies. Um, a regime that's excessive and illogical compared to other uh, less precise technologies that are applied to agriculture and food production. Now, let me give you a couple of examples of what this uh, discriminatory asymmetrical regulation means in practice. Um, about 40 years ago, uh, in several parts of the world, uh, there was a new variety of, of bread wheat produced uh, called Triticum agropyrotriticum. Uh, triticum means bread wheat, and agropyrotriticum is the new, the new strain. And this was produced in uh, the old USSR, um, the Canada, the US, France, Germany, China, and elsewhere. And T. agropyrotriticum uh, consisted of the entire genome of bread wheat and, and hybridized into it uh, through conventional techniques was the entire genome of a wild grass variously called couch grass or quack grass. Uh, and, and so uh, this contains the uh, ordinary expression products of bread wheat plus tens of thousands of new genes uh, with their uh, genetic expression products interacting who knows how 
with the uh, pro with the um, uh, macromolecules of wheat. Um, when this uh, new this new variety went into the field, um, no one, least of all activists or regulators, uh, wanted to review it. No one asked whether um, the introduction of all of the genes from a wild grass make wheat more weed-like, more invasive in the field. No one asked whether any of these tens of thousands of new gene products uh, introduce toxins uh, or, or allergens. Uh, no one asked these questions when it went into the field first, when it was scaled up, uh, when it went into commercial scale, or when it went into the food supply as, as bread. Uh, if, if, if someone, however, were to move a single gene from quackgrass into triticum, into bread wheat, using gene splicing techniques, that would bring down uh, a hugely expansive, expensive, uh, dilatory, regulatory regime that would involve uh, at least USDA, possibly EPA, uh, and, as well as well as FDA. Um, the, pro the process would uh, would become vastly more expensive, uh, uh, much slower, and um, uh, and whatever you think of uh, how much regulation is appropriate, it's impossible to reconcile the disparity between no regulation for a, for a crude, um, an imprecise and unpredictable process, and massive regulation for one that accomplishes essentially the same thing, but is much more precise and predictable. It cannot be reconciled. Uh, similarly, if, um, uh, if you have uh, t high school teenagers who might want to enter a high school science fair and uh, do a, a, a project on agriculture, um, if, the, if your uh, student goes to a, um, a seed store and buys a packet of, uh, of tomato seeds, takes them to a, a radiology suite and irradiates them and then plants them to look for, for interesting mutants uh, that would be caused by the radiation, there's no regulation uh, by the government of any kind. But once again, if a single gene is moved into those tomatoes or even a, a gene is deleted using gene splicing techniques, the student would have to uh, obtain the services of an, an, an institutional biosafety committee, probably through a university or a hospital, and would have to somehow get permission from USDA and or EPA in order to plant those seeds. Again, this is the kind of discrepancy that can't be reconciled, makes no sense at all, and prevents the wider use, uh, the diffusion of the superior uh, technology. Uh, from high school students on to um, multinational companies. Now, uh, if, um, uh, if you doubt uh, uh, that there's discrimination against uh, the use of these newer, superior, more precise technologies, uh, consider, as I said, the, the complete bans that exist in three California counties and one that was just uh, instituted in Switzerland uh, within the past week or two, uh, they having a very liberal referendum policy similar to Californians. Um, I have uh, a box of uh, little packets of gene spliced uh, uh, seeds, soy, soybean seeds that are available for you uh, that have the uh, the book cover on the on the front. I hope you'll all pick pick uh, pick up these up. Um, but but again, uh, you can do whatever you like with these, as long as you don't put them in the ground in Mendocino, Trinity, or uh, or Marin counties. It's completely ridiculous. Uh, you, you, um, now let me remind you of uh, some more of the distinguished history of genetic modification considered generically um, with which we all have a great deal of experience. The, the first slide uh, is, is, I think, a, a quite interesting juxtaposition. Um, at the top is the, uh, the very primitive precursor of modern-day corn, uh, a plant that's still found in parts of Mexico called teosinte. 
And uh, it's re at really quite remarkable uh, that by dint of uh, a very laborious uh, selection and, and crossing, that farmers and plant breeders were able to get from this uh, to this. This is a, a primitive uh, precursor of modern corn that's, in effect, been reconstructed by doing various crosses, uh, just as an, an illustration to see uh, what intermediates uh, look like. But as you can see, the Tiocinti has next to nothing in the way of, of kernels. and But once we get here, we have uh, closely packed pretty regular uh, kernels that are swollen with um, starch, protein, and oil. And then um, uh, via conventional techniques, we've gotten to um, the modern varieties, plural, modern varieties of, of corn or maize uh, that have been widely adapted and widely manipulated for a variety of purposes. So there are distinct, var distinct varieties that are used for corn meal or corn oil, uh, for feeding to livestock, or the, the wonderful sweet corn that we enjoy on the cob during the summer. Um, and, and again, there are a huge number of, of varieties of this adapted to various uh, microenvironments around the world, different climates and, uh, and different uh, sets of, of pests and disease. Essentially the same story um, with the tomato. I'm, I'm only going to show these two, David, but thank you. Um, sa similar story with, uh, with tomato. Um, on, the, on the right, this, this little thing, cross-sectioned and stained, is the, the pr very primitive precursor of modern-day tomatoes that still does grow and is found in, in the Andes of South America. And more than, um, than a, an edible uh, fruit or vegetable, this, uh, this more closely resembles a golf ball. It's small, it's green, it's toxic, it's bitter, uh, and yet... Uh, over centuries, again, plant breeders and farmers have wrought uh, amazing things through conventional plant breeding and gotten to the uh, current day varieties of tomato. Again, different varieties intended for different purposes, very different uh, varieties for processing into sauce or juice, uh, into um, uh, uh, eating and, and salads to, in, and for cooking and so on, and highly adapted uh, for various ecosystems around the world. The, uh, the tomatoes that you would grow in a backyard garden, for example, in Spokane, very different from those that you would want to try to grow in Savannah. Um, now, how, how have we been able uh, to accomplish uh, this kind of thing with conventional breeding. Well, uh, Eric Lander, a professor at MIT, has a wonderful observation about that. Eric says, uh, quote, uh, evolution has been taking notes. It tries experiments. It wakes up each morning, does a little mutagenesis, changes a nucleotide here and there, and sees how it works. If it's a success, evolution keeps the notes. In this notebook, we have all the information of the greatest experimental tinkerer ever, unquote. Uh, and I would say, uh, extending that rich metaphor through the centuries, plant breeders and farmers have edited that notebook. Uh, and so currently in the United States, there are some 200 crops, nearly all of which were introduced as alien species over two to three centuries. Uh, since the, the U.S. was settled. Uh, and then uh, over the years, ha these have been genetically improved to adapt them to local conditions, to climate, to local pests and diseases, uh, and, and for various purposes. Uh, gene splicing technology has similar goals, but is more precise, more predictable, and much faster. Uh, a current snapshot of where we are in gene splicing uh, reveals improvements in traits that benefit farmers and processors, and I, I alluded to some of these already, uh, and a few that benefit consumers directly. Uh, but there are not very many of these. One example, for example, is a, a long uh, shelf life carnation that will last for a couple of weeks uh, after it's been cut, much, much longer than uh, conventional unmodified ones. 
Uh, there are currently uh, um, about uh, 200 million acres uh, worldwide under cultivation to uh, gene splice crops. Uh, it, that was actually 2004, about a 20 percent increase over the previous year. Uh, in the U.S., more than three quarters of cotton farmers are planting gene spliced cotton, and more than 90 percent of all soybeans are now grown from gene spliced seeds. Um, the, um, the advantages uh, have been manifest. Uh, but, um, and perhaps we'll talk about this later, but, but not many of them are evident uh, to consumers, which is part of the reason I think that there's been as much resistance as there has been. So, but some of the advantages include um, gene spliced soybeans resulting in a reduction in pesticide use of more than 20 million pounds annually, uh, which produce about $1.2 billion extra for for growers. And there are similar advantages of gene spliced corn and, and gene spliced cotton. There are a couple of, uh, of little tidbits uh, that you may find surprising about the state of, of gene spliced crops and foods. Uh, more than 80 percent of processed foods on supermarket shelves currently contain ingredients from gene spliced plants. Most of these are derived from, uh, from corn. Uh, anything that's sweetened with high fructose corn syrup, for example, um, anything that's made with corn oil, for example, and uh, and also given that uh, almost all the soybeans and therefore soybean oil comes from uh, gene spliced plants, uh, anything that contains uh, soybean oil, salad dressings, mayonnaise, and so on, uh, all contain gene spliced ingredients. Uh, as a result of this ubiquity on our uh, supermarket shelves, Americans have consumed more than a trillion servings, more than a million billion servings of, uh, of gene spliced uh, products. Uh, and, from the dirt, and from the dirt to the dinner plate, uh, there's not been not a single mishap that has resulted in injury to a person or an ecosystem. Not, not a single mishap with all of that experience both in the field and in our food. Uh, I think uh, the future uh, of this, at least if it's not uh, uh, encumbered by regulation and activists unduly, um, holds a number of uh, really uh, astonishing things. Enhanced nutrition, uh, production of medicines, so-called biofarming. The, the pun is in the spelling B-I-O-P-H. A-R-M-I-N-G, uh, various environmental applications such as the sequestration of heavy metals from uh, contaminated waste sites, and, and one subtle one that could be very important to California and the Western United States is water conservation. Um, scientists are working and, and have achieved some successes in introducing drought resistance and the ability to grow with lower quality uh, water. Uh, such as recycled water or even brackish water. Um, uh, water, as you know, is going to become a, an important issue in California and the West uh, in coming years, particularly if we have another drought similar to the one that we endured about 15 years ago. Uh, government regulation. Uh, several points of, uh, of scientific consensus I'd like to point out to you. Uh, first, Neither the use of gene splicing technology nor moving genes per se makes organisms unsafe. Even moving genes uh, across very uh, great phylogenetic distances, that is between uh, extremely unrelated organisms, is per se unsafe. Um, what makes a difference is not the source of a, of a gene that's being moved, but its function. Uh, and, and the way it interacts in its new environment. Um, third, uh, and this is just a, a common sense rule uh, of regulation of any kind, the degree of regulatory scrutiny should be commensurate with risk. But as in those examples that I gave with triticum, agropyrotriticum, and the, uh, our hypothetical student at a science fair, uh, that rule is, uh, is 
uh, unequivocally violated in the discriminatory regulation that exists against gene splicing. In fact, what we've done is to create uh, regulatory regimes in, where, in which there's an inverse relationship between the perceived degree of risk and the degree of regulatory scrutiny, something which is, is simply uh, uh, nonsensical. Um, official regulatory policy uh, says much the same thing as, as my uh, previous summary points, uh, that merely the use of gene splicing techniques is not an appropriate trigger for oversight, um, but uh, that has not been translated effectively into what happens on the ground at agencies like USDA and EPA and, to a lesser degree, FDA. Uh, at, at all of these agencies, uh, the use of gene splicing techniques does uh, provide the trigger for more draconian, uh, more expensive, um, more uh, involved regulatory regimes. Uh, and regulatory policies capture virtually all gene spliced organisms, regardless of risk. The result is that um, experiments in the field are 10 to 20 times more expensive to do with a gene spliced organism than with one that's been conventionally modified, but which is virtually indistinguishable. And if you do the math for that uh, 10 to 20 times more expensive, you'll see that, uh, that 90 to 95 percent of your budget goes to uh, unnecessary, gratuitous, unscientific regulatory requirements. Uh, this adds about $50 million to the cost of commercializing a new plant variety. $50 million is not uh, terribly much in the, in the context of developing a new drug, for example, but for developing uh, a new insect-resistant variety of lettuce uh, or a, um, a variety of uh, cauliflower that's enhanced with a certain vitamin, it's, it's really quite a lot of money and is uh, uh, debilitating. So uh, again, as a result of this discriminatory regulation, we have a regulatory morass which has spilled over to other areas, including questions of legal liability. Overregulation has already damaged whole sectors of agricultural biotech and mortally wounded others. In conclusion, then, as long as we continue to accept the myth that there is something uniquely hazardous and worrisome about gene spliced organisms and their cr products, we'll continue to argue these issues to have these uh, pseudo controversies ad nauseum and unnecessarily. Uh, the public will be hopelessly confused, as were, uh, as I mentioned, some 45 percent of the voters in Sonoma County uh, last month. Uh, public policy will remain unscientific and contrary to the public interest. And practicing scientists who perform or wish to perform field trials of gene spliced organisms will find much of their budget squandered by gratuitous regulation. Uh, thank you very much. That concludes my remarks. Dr. Bruce Ames is professor of biochemistry and molecular biology at the University of California, Berkeley. Dr. Ames is the inventor of the Ames test, a system for easily and cheaply testing the mutagenicity of compounds. His research on cancer and aging, including more than 500 publications, have resulted in his being among the few hundred most, sci most cited scientists in all fields. Dr. Ames's research focuses on identifying mutagenic agents that damage human DNA and defenses against them. He's also working to elucidate the consequences of DNA damage for cancer and aging. So my interest is in disease prevention. I worked for many years on causes of cancer, what's causing cancer, how do you prevent it, and then that always gets you into mechanisms. So I was interested in mutagens and how to prevent DNA getting mutated and all kinds of things. And in the course of it, I became more and more upset because the government seems to spend all its time on what I thought was trivia and not enough time on the important things. And as every businessman or anybody knows, if you have thousands of 
minuscule, unimportant risks out there, the public gets completely confused and they don't know what's important anymore. So I'd like to just discuss where I think, uh, so I'm going to talk about risk more in general and what I think is important and that's your diet. Everybody's eating lousy diets and that's doing you in, not that uh, part per billion of pesticide. So if you ask um, the top epidemiologists what's causing cancer, smoking is about a third of cancer, bad diets is about a third of cancer, I put too many calories, obesity, 30% of the kids come into Children's Hospital, where I'm working now, are obese. And obesity is linked to 40 different diseases. Uh, so, uh, and too little fiber and micronutrients, I'm going to talk about that a bit. Then chronic infections, when you get an infection, like hepatitis B virus in your liver, or helicobacter in your stomach, your white cells are trying to defend you against the invader. And what do they do? They pour out all these nasty mutagens. They're powerful oxidants, hypochlorite. You know what hypochlorite is? Clorox. So you know, every time you get a cold or an infection, your white cells are defending you with Clorox, trying to kill that virus or bacteria. And that's a nasty mutagen. And then if they're also pouring out hydrogen peroxide and peroxynitrite, which uh, nitrates you and uh, oxidizes you. So, and uh, you're, People are worried about chlorine. Every time you get a cold, you're chlorinating yourself from all this Clorox. So, uh, so anyway, so that's due, uh, about 20% of the cancer in the world is due to chronic infections. Uh, all through Asia and Africa, uh, hepatitis B, hepatitis C, and then uh, helicobacter. Everybody in Japan's infected with this bacteria that lives uh, between the stomach lining. Uh, there's a a sort of bag in your stomach protecting you against the hydrochloric acid and the bacteria can get in there, helicobacter, and cause a chronic inflammation. And so whenever you get that, it eventually it leads to cancer. And hormones, about 20% of cancer, estrogen uh, levels are related to breast cancer and testosterone levels to prostate cancer. So anyway, uh, you get a lot of cell division. You can fix mutations and occupations a little bit. People argue about this number. But this was my best guess, a few percent. And you want strict rules. You don't want every worker waiting around in chemicals, which happened last century. And uh, we learned that occasional the workers in the aniline dye industry, some of them got bladder cancer from uh, aromatic amines, and uh, et cetera, et cetera. And chimney sweeps in England were going up and down the chimneys, and they got cancer too. Anyway, so you need strict rules there. And then pollution is our big red herring because we're spending all the money compared to anything else, everything else put together five times on trying to get rid of that last part per billion of some pesticide residue or whatever. And it's all, it's not going to save any lives as far as I'm concerned. It may make people feel good in it. Uh, but uh, so I think that's mostly a red herring. I'm not saying there isn't a, a, a farm worker getting doused in pesticide every day may well uh, lead to some trouble. But uh, little bits of pesticide residue are not plausible as anything very serious in terms of health. Anyway, I'll talk about that a little bit. Next slide. So we have this myth out there, there's a cancer epidemic. There isn't a cancer epidemic. Cancer rates have been coming down for years. Uh, the cancer epidemic there is is due to smoking. And if you fact, so if you're correct for smoking, uh, attributed to smoking, it's been going up. If you're correct for smoking, cancer rates have been coming down for a long time. So uh, the leading people correct for age, because cancer goes up with the fourth power of age. I'll show you a slide on that later. And so you don't want to look at cancer in a group of 80-year-olds, 70-year-olds, versus a group of 30-year-olds. There's not going to be much cancer in 30-year-olds. You get a little peak from of childhood cancer where you've inherited a mutant gene from your mother or your father, but otherwise it just goes up inexorably with age. And so they look, so when they look at this, they look at cancer in a group, in the same age group in two different years. So anyway, cancer rates are coming down. This is by Sir Richard Pito, who's a leading epidemiologist in the world. Uh, next slide. And uh, a new study says yes, but 
150, uh, 200 previous studies say no. Did you hear that, folks? The answer is yes. So epidemiology is a fiendishly difficult science. You have to be really smart to do epidemiology because it's so easy to get the wrong answer. And the, uh, you're looking at cancer, and the people are doing all sorts of different things. So the epidemiologist joke is Miami's a weird place. Everybody's born Hispanic and dies Jewish. So, <laughs> so that's, called, that's called confounding, which means that uh, you think it's due to one thing and it's really due to something else. And anyway, epidemiology is good at detecting big risks, but it's useless for trying to detect some minor risk. And, uh, and plus, uh, one study says this, and the next study says that, and then finally somebody does a meta-analysis and puts them all together. It's easy to get the wrong answer, and reporters never put things in balance. It's always, ah, there's a new scare, or there's a new something. Next slide. This says, my main fear used to be cats, now it's carcinogens. So, <laughs> so why not do animal cancer tests? Rats and mice are relatively cheap. So people decided that after they saw that in the early chemical industry where workers were dipping their hands in the stuff and breathing it in and getting huge amounts that were really high <coughs> exposure, a number of the workers got cancer, and we don't want our workers to be guinea pigs. So everybody said, let's test it in rats and mice. Now, it costs a million bucks to do a cancer test in rats or mice because you, use, you need 50, a third of the animals are getting cancer anyway, and you have the problem of statistics, so it, you need at least 50 animals and 50 controls. And then uh, you, people said, well, let's get the maximum mileage from the test. It costs a million bucks to do an animal cancer test because pathologists are expensive and all of that. So anyway, we made a number of assumptions, and they've all turned out to be wrong. The first assumption was that um, what do we want to test? Well, we'll test synthetic chemicals. Those are the dangerous things. But 99.9% .9 of the chemicals you're ingesting are natural chemicals. And everybody just assumed nature's benign. But every plant is full of 100 toxic chemicals it uses to kill off the insects and the predators. And so I'll talk about that in animal cancer tests exactly the same hit rate as synthetic pests. So, so one thing is we only looked at a very minor part of the chemicals we're being exposed to, and then because of the occupational uh, causes of cancer that we knew, and we just concluded, oh, something shows up in an animal cancer test, that's what's causing cancer. And then we, to save money, we gave the cancer the animal, the maximum tolerated dose. Well, the maximum tolerated dose is you find a level of kill the animal, you back off a little bit, and the animal has to lose 10% of the weight, on, otherwise you're not high enough. And you feed it every day of the lifetime. And of course, when you get exposed, you expect, except for occasional occupational exposure, you're getting exposed to some <laughs> tiny amount. So we made the assumption, well, if we can go from this huge dose down to a very low dose. Next <laughs> assumption was carcinogen and that's turning out not to be right. And then we made the next assumption is that carcinogens are rare. We're not going to find very many. We'll eliminate them, and we'll have a cancer-free world. And that isn't true either. Next slide. So uh, Lois Gold, who's here, and I have written 150 papers kind of puncturing environmental balloons and uh, traces of pesticide and all these kinds of things. And we put all the nails in the coffin, but the specter keeps on coming out because uh, I won't go into all the sociology of that. But anyway, uh, I think the science uh, has been done with very well, and there really isn't anything there. So the first thing we pointed out is uh, Lois runs the Animal uh, Carcinogenic Potency Database. She's taken every animal cancer test in the world, put it in a database. It's all up on the web. You can see the potency of each carcinogen and who did the test and everything about it. Anyway, if you, the first question is carcinogens aren't rare. Sixty percent of all the chemicals ever tested in rats and mice come out positive. Is this just because they're picking more suspicious chemicals? We don't think so. Uh, and then chemicals tested in rats or mice, it's 50 percent or more. So, and natural pesticides, you get exactly the same hit rate as 
as synthetic pesticides. And the, every plant you eat is full of these things. And then mold toxins and natural chemicals and roasted coffee and uh, commercial pesticides. Anyway, uh, drugs that have uh, passed all the, uh, that FDA database of drug submission. Half of everything they've ever tested is positive. And we think it's a high dose artifact. Sorry to, uh, so the people who've been stuffing chemicals down the throats of rats for 20 years aren't very happy to hear this, and they really don't like us. But anyway, it's still true. <laughs> Next slide. Yeah. So Rachel Carson, for the first time in the history of the world, every human being is now subject to contact with dangerous chemicals from the moment of conception until death. Now that's not a statement any toxicologist thinks makes any sense, because everything's chemicals. Rachel Carson's made of chemicals. And so if you want to say everything natural is... Yeah, she's toxic. Yeah. <laughs> if you want to say everything natural is benign and everything man-made is evil, well, okay, but there's really no evidence. Aflatoxins, one of the most potent carcinogens, they know, and it's made by a mold. And all the metals are carcinogen are toxic and carcinogenic, and those have been around through all of evolution. And our defense systems don't work chemical by chemical. Every, every time you eat a plant, you're getting 100 toxic chemicals. Uh, broccoli has a different set than coffee, that is a different set than asparagus. And how do we deal with it? Our liver is just chock full of defense enzymes. And by group, you get an oxidizing agent into you, you induce antioxidant defenses, and then you're more resistant. So radiation is an oxidative mutant. A little bit of radiation, the animal responds and puts up antioxidant defenses and more resistant to higher doses of radiation. That's how animals survive in a world of toxic chemicals, natural toxic chemicals. Anyway, next slide. So this is what's in cabbage. Sorry about all this, but cyanide, <laughs> isothiocyanate, cyanide derivatives, all sorts of nasty things. And they're designed to kill. That's what they're there for. They're, they're nature's pesticides, and they're designed to kill those insects munching on the plant or the predator eating the plant. And what plant breeders have done is to lower the level of these things. Because when the potato came out of the Andes, it was chock full of solanine and chaconine. You feed a kid a meal of green potatoes, it can kill you because the green is just chlorophyll, but when the plant gets uncovered, it jacks up all its defenses because some ins insect can bite it, and it's just chock full of toxic chemicals. So anyway, that's how, uh, and so if you test these things, and we did a search in Lois Gold's database, and we have started finding a few natural pesticides that have been tested, exactly the same hit rate, half of them, as natural pesticides that have been tested. And the compounds they use as pesticides have already been screened through all of this. Next slide. So, and so we did a calculation. You're eating 0.05 milligrams of potential carcinogens from natural pesticide, uh, from synthetic pesticide residues. And natural pesticide residues, you're eating 1,500 milligrams a day. So 99.99% of the pesticides you eat are natural chemicals in plants. Well, and the hit rate is exactly the same in, uh, for breaking chromosomes or for car finding carcinogens or mutagens or all that, yet 99.99% are the natural compounds. I'm not saying that's what's causing cancer. I'm, I think all these high doses are giving us the wrong answer. But it's, uh, you, you start looking at the whole picture, you don't get very worried about the parts per billion of pesticide residues. Next slide. So we did a table in one of our papers showing uh, all the natural pesticides we could find that had ever been tested for carcinogens in the world. And these are all the carcinogens, these are the non-carcinogens, and the carcinogens are present in anise, apple, apricot, banana, basil, beer, broccoli, Brussels sprouts, all the way to tomato, turmeric, and turnip. So there's nothing you can eat in the supermarket that doesn't have carcinogens in it, a rodent carcinogen at high doses. Don't worry about it. Okay, <laughs> next slide. And this is coffee. When you roast coffee, you get over a thousand chemicals. So we went and looked up the whole coffee literature, and we found a list of a thousand chemicals. We ran them through the database, and these have been shown to be carcinogen. These are not carcinogen. There's still a thousand chemicals left to test. So it turns out you get more chemicals, more carcinogen in a cup of coffee than pesticide residues you get in a year. 
but the EPA drinks their cups of coffee and tries to get rid of that last part per trillion of pesticide residue. It's all, it's spinning your wheels and not getting anywhere. But that's what regulatory bureaucracies do. Yeah. Next slide. So this says, uh, and activists, we have a scare story every week in the newspaper. Oh, this is just a quote, falsehood flies and the truth comes <laughs> limping after so that when men come to be undeceived, it is too late. The jest is over and the tale has had its effect. Jonathan Swift. Next slide. Okay, this is some British toxicologist uh, published this in a paper. It's an uh, overview of aims and achievements of toxicology. The aim is to prevent human disease from chemical and uh, or, or illusion, as you, and the reality is provide living for contract laboratory, civil servants, lawyers, statisticians, <laughs> consultants, and conference organizers. <laughs> the achievements or the illusion is public reassured that chemicals are properly tested for carcinogenic activity, and the reality is public worried to death or indifference by politicians and sensational press testimony. Anyway, next slide. Life expectancy, despite all of this, gets longer every year. This is Women, this is men. Life expectancy in 1900, 46 years for men, 49 for women. And now, so we've gained 25 to 30 years over the course of the century. And I'll tell you in a minute, we're going to gain even more than that the next century. And they're really important things to worry about, not all this trivia. <laughs> now, as you may know, uh, women have a longer life expectancy than men. And single men have an eight-year shorter life expectancy than married men. And both men and women know why. Single men self-destruct. They drink too much, and they smoke too much, and they don't eat any veggies. <laughs> so it's the wives that civilize. Anyway, next slide. So now I'd like to talk about what's really doing you in. OK. So you need energy made in your body every day, and you're burning fuel to do that. And burning means taking electrons from the fat and carbohydrate, and you add the electrons to oxygen, and you add four electrons to oxygen, you're home safe to water. But no machine is perfect. Even nature makes some errors. Uh, and so you get 1 or 2% single electron addition, so you're bleeding off a little superoxide and hydrogen peroxide, and these are powerful oxidants. But we have defenses to deal with them. But in fact, they're not perfect. Nature doesn't want to be perfect. In the old, uh, no, but people didn't used to reach age 40. Age 40 was an old man or woman for most of human history. And so it doesn't pay nature to put a lot of defenses to get you to 70, because nobody got to 70 in the old days. So next slide. Well, or uh, nobody in the sense of not uh, lots of people. Yeah. Anyway, this is uh, cancer, cumulative cancer risk, rats. Mice look like this. Humans look like that. So in 60 million years of evolution, we've gone from a short-life creature with a high age-specific cancer rate to a long-life creature with a low age-specific cancer rate. That's why they have to correct for age, because cancer goes up. And it's related to metabolic rate. Rats have much higher metabolic rates than people. I once was at a, uh, a meeting of some epidemiologists, and Malcolm Pike was explaining that the Seventh-day Adventists have half the cancer rate and live a few years longer than everybody else. And they don't smoke. They don't drink. They're mostly vegetarians. They lead very moral, straight lives. And someone said, what do they die of? And he said, boredom. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, the Seventh-day Adventists go out like this. Okay. So what that says to me is cancer is one of the degenerative diseases of old age. You're going to get people to stop smoking and add, eat good diets. This will come out like that. But they'll. It's built in with aging, and I'll tell you why. Next slide. So we got interested in DNA damage, and I got particularly, so uh, your DNA is getting battered up all the time. You get a lesion in the DNA, and then repair enzymes are always cruising along the DNA looking for trouble. And when they see a bulky group here, they just clip out a piece. It all gets filled in, and you repair the damage, copying the base pair. And then the damage the oxynucleoside, what do you do with it? You pee it out. And then, uh, if, then the very specific <laughs> enzymes, the DNA glycosylases, and there are a dozen enzymes that are the same in bacteria and humans. They've gone up all the way through evolution, and that tells us what nature thinks is important. Half of them are for oxidized bases. So oxidation has always been important. And 
uh, some are for alkylated bases and other things. And there you have very specific enzymes that look for that base pair, take the base off the sugar, and then uh, another enzyme comes in, cleaves this, put in the right base, sews it up, and you've repaired it, and the base goes in the urine. So people in Berkeley get high on all sorts of things, but I was high on urine for a few years. And so, if, so we looked in human urine for the known radiation damage products, which are oxidative products, and we found them in rat urine and human urine. So we tried to calculate how many hits there were per cell per day. And, well, the answer is 100,000 oxidative damages get repaired out of every cell every day. So you're getting battered up all the time. And so when they put a benzpyrin and find one, one ten of the six bases, is a benzpyrin or something. It's small potatoes compared to what you're doing to your own body just by living. And uh, next slide. And it goes up with age. These are young rats. These are old rats. So by the time a rat is old, it has 67,000 or so oxidative lesions in per cell in every cell of your body all the time. And you're doing well because the rats mostly live a reasonably long life. Next slide. And so you're, and it's oxidative damage. So this is protein. You're oxidizing your protein. This is people. Uh, this is rats. This is people. These are two diseases of premature aging, progeria and Werner's syndrome. So you're oxidizing all the time. And as I'll show you, it gets worse with age. Next slide. And this shows lipids. So you're going rancid all the time. That's oxidized fat. And your brain is going rancid. Uh, uh, and so it just goes up with age. Uh, Next slide. So we got interested in where all this oxidation is coming from. The logical place is the mitochondria, because that's where you're doing this burning. And uh, the mitochondria, the most complex organelle in the cell, and it's uh, you're uh, burning the fat and carbohydrate and adding the electrons to oxygen. And so we wrote a review on it about 10 years ago and got interested enough from the review, we decided to work on it. So we're working on how to delay mitochondrial decay. It's more and more of the degenerative disease of aging, Parkinson's, Alzheimer's, diabetes, are being uh, hook, uh, tied to mitochondrial decay. Next slide. So there are lots of, this is the inside of a mitochondria. And you have these four complexes, which call the electron transport chain because you're passing the electrons along. And what you're doing is pumping protons across the inner membrane of the mitochondria, so it's like a rechargeable battery. You have a charge across this membrane, and that allows complex five here to make ATP. And you're making kilos of ATP in your body every day, and ATP powers your muscles, powers your brain, powers all your biochemistry. So you're running on ATP energy, and it's a compact form of chemical energy, that you and it's all made in the mitochondria. So, and you're also bleeding a few, off a few oxygen radicals all the time, and as you get older, more and more come out, and you start going downhill. So, next slide. So this is young mitochondria, it look nice and sharp, old mitochondria are kind of fuzzy, like old people, <laughs> or, or, or some of us anyway. Uh, next slide. So mitochondria from old rats made those wrong with loader cardiolipin, which is a key lipid in the mitochondrial membrane, lower membrane potential, lower oxygen utilization, increased oxygen leakage. And we've figured out how to reverse that, at least in rats. So I'm very optimistic that uh, life expectancy is going to get longer, faster than this last century, because science, aging used to be considered way too complicated to work on, and now we have all the tools. Used to, I used to know the dozen people in the world who are any good who are working on aging. Now there are tens of thousands of bright young people getting into the field. So I didn't know it would do me any good, but aging uh, is going to, people are going to live longer. Next slide. And so we've found a couple of normal mitochondrial metabolites we can feed to old rats. This just shows the cardiolipin going down. You feed this, it comes back. But I don't want to talk about that next, but just to say that all this exists, because I'll get back to it in a minute. Next slide. What is L-car? Uh, acetylcarnitine. Uh, I've, uh, the university took out a patent on a work, and I founded a company called Juvenon that sells these pills. Uh, but I put all my stock in a foundation, so I have no financial interest in the company. 
uh, but it's selling lots of pills. And this shows <laughs> lipoic acid, uh, which uh, solves the problem of the extra oxidants and brings it down to the level of a young animal. So if you're an old rat, you can be very enthusiastic. If you're an old person, we still have to do more clinical trials. <laughs> in a fit of enthusiasm, when we were doing all this, I called up my son in New York and said, one of my students seems to be changing old rats into young rats. And it was silent for a few seconds. Then my son said, that's all very well and good, but you let me know when you do the next step, when you change old people to young rats. <laughs> <laughs> so, so your children don't let you get away with anything. Right, next slide. <laughs> So this is biochemistry. All people have worked out all these cycles and pathways and everything. Well, to keep that powered, what do you need? You need fuel. That's the fat and carbohydrate, a little protein. And you need your micronutrients. And the 40, 40 micronutrients you need to keep all this biochemistry humming along. And I'm going to make the argument when you don't get enough of one, you get massive DNA damage. And that's what I think is doing a lot of a sin. Anyway, that's the argument I'm going to give you. It's partly vision, but partly we're pinning it down. So but I wouldn't... I'm sure you get enough of the 40. Okay. Well, you could take a multivitamin mineral pill as insurance and try and eat a good, varied, balanced diet. Next slide. So, uh, so we need about a dozen metals. Uh, iron, zinc, copper, manganese, magnesium, calcium, etc. And so people s sort of forgot about uh, deficiencies because you don't see much scurvy anymore. The British sailors used to go off on these long trips. 30% of them would die, their teeth would fall out, they were all getting scurvy. But then they realized that there was something in limes that prevented it, so every British ship went out uh, picked up a load of limes, and the sailors all sucked limes. That's why they were called limeys. And they didn't get scurvy, and it was vitamin C. But 25% of the population is still ingesting less than half of the amount of vitamin C they need. Now, that doesn't mean that you load up with kilos of vitamin C every day, and it's going to uh, prolong your life. It just means that it's the people who are not getting enough are in trouble. And the, who are they? The poor and the obese. And a lot of people who don't eat good, balanced diet. So, and uh, iron, a quarter of young menstruating women have less than half the RDA of, of iron, and iron deficiency really batters your biochemistry up, and I'll show you, DNA damage, all sorts of things. Why? Because women are losing all that iron, and they need to replace it. Most men are getting too much iron. Uh, so, and zinc, 10% of the population, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So for whatever micronutrient you look at, we're talking about some 10% or more of the population is really low. Next slide. So, and uh, the poor tend to be worse. This is iron, this is menstruating women, and this is uh, black women. Next slide. And this, uh, so I partly got into this because one, uh, uh, Jim McGregor, who's a cytogenetist who's working at US USDA, came to my lab, and he had just stumbled on the fact that when rats don't get enough folic acid, they break their chromosomes, just like radiation. He was irradiating rats, and he saw all these broken chromosomes, and then he gave them an odd diet where the folate was too low due to a mistake, and he saw just as many broken chromosomes as when he really zapped them with radiation. And he had just come to my lab all excited by this, and I put my graduate student to figure out why, and we figured out why. And next slide. This shows uh, a, a human with a low folate who has very high chromosome breaks, and you feed him folic acid, it goes down, and then he put him on folic acid permanently. Next slide. And so we worked out the mechanism, and it's just like radiation. Radiation, the dangerous part of radiation is when you get you get clusters of electrons and you damage a base on each strand. So these are wound around each other. And then the repair enzymes are always taking out the base, but then when it does that, this strand is holding it there. But if they're two across from each other, then this happens and you break your chromosomes. And those are hard to fix. And the radiation biologists think that's the most dangerous part of radiation, are these broken chromosomes. Well, folic acid deficiency does the exact same thing. Now, folic acid... Does anybody know what the word folia means? It's the Latin word for leaf. 
my mentor at Caltech when I got my PhD first isolated folic acid from four tons of spinach. So you get it from greens and a lot of people don't eat a lot of greens and then they're not getting the folic acid and they're breaking the chromosome. Now they're adding it to the flower. Uh, next slide. So this shows B12 deficient, folate deficient, breaking, next slide. And some guy in Australia has also showed B2, vitamin B12 deficiency and folic acid deficiency, break your chromosomes, next slide. And this is B12 deficiency, quite common in LD, next slide. And so we got interested in iron because iron is the main deficiency in the world. Two billion women in the world are anemic or borderline anemic and kids. And in fact, uh, Joyce McCann in my lab is writing a series of reviews on the brain growth spurt, the last trimester of pregnancy and the first two years of your life. You're making 10 of the 14th or something like that neural connections. You don't get enough iron, the brain doesn't do well, the kids don't do well in school. And we're talking about a lot of kids in the world and, uh, and a lot of the poor. And you don't get enough omega-3 fatty acids, which are these long-chain fatty acids you get from deep sea fish, the brain doesn't develop well. And they've done rat experiments, human experiments. You don't get enough choline, the brain doesn't develop well. So we're trying to clean out that field and writing a series of definitive reviews. So I think the poor are doing in the brains, too, by not eating well. I don't know how much, but it's uh, at least we're... They, these micronutrients don't cost anything. They're all dirt cheap. You can get a, at Costco, you can get a bottle of a year's supply of pills, 350 pills, for 10 bucks. <coughs> so anyway, it's an insurance pill. It isn't going to, you still need to eat a good diet. But anyway, <laughs> next slide. So, uh, so iron deficiency, your cells start pouring out oxidants, oxygen radicals. And we worked out, and this just shows uh, inadequate pregnancy outcome anemic pregnant women, you get way, way more low birth weight babies, preterm babies, poor weight gains, all this has consequence. Next slide. And so one of the postdocs in my lab was looking at zinc deficiency, taking human cells and culture and making them slightly deficient in zinc. Again, they pour out oxidants, next slide, and they batter up the DNA. Next. This is something called a comet assay. So you're getting oxidative damage to DNA. And then another postdoc in my lab worked out why, and so we worked out the mechanism, and we found a half a dozen micronutrients end up disrupting complex four in the mitochondria, and when that happens, you start pouring oxygen radicals out into the cell. So it's like irradiating yourself by not eating enough iron or zinc or biotin or all these different things. And so now we've found about a dozen different vitamins and minerals that you take human cells and culture, make them a little deficient, and you start battering up the DNA, and, and the cells age prematurely. Next slide. So this is complex four. When you <coughs> knock that out, you start pouring out oxygen, right? and we figured out why this deficiency knocks it out. Next slide. So the cells, this is biotin deficiency, they age prematurely. So they normally go through a certain number of population doublings before they senesce. So why is that? Because you're battering up the DNA and all that. And I think nature wants it that way because through all of human evolution, the minerals have been required and the vitamins have been required. And what happens when an animal ends up in an area where it doesn't have enough iron or enough magnesium? It has to <coughs> prioritize. And what do you prioritize? Well, you want to scurry around and find some more food, and it couldn't care less about DNA damage and long-term health. So, so every time you're short of a micronutrient, I think from the time from the fertilized egg up until you die, you pay a price when you don't have enough of a particular vitamin or mineral. And half the country is magnesium deficient, and a quarter of women are iron deficient. And these things don't cost anything. It's crazy. So we shouldn't be spending our time on chasing after that little bit of pesticide. It's, uh, it's what we do to ourselves, and a lot of people don't want to hear that. Everybody's a victim, but it's what you're doing to yourself, your bad diet and not, not getting any exercise. Next slide. This is biotin filling up uh, deficiency, human cells filling up with oxygen. Next slide. 
and we're filling in this table. Now, next slide. Sorry, I got a little carried away. This is magnesium deficiency making cells senescently, and you get DNA protein crosslinks. Next slide. Okay. Uh, 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 obesity. This was the cover of The Economist just two years ago today. Uh, and so you all know the country's getting obese. And obesity is linked to 40 different diseases. It's a disaster. Diabetes and, and the costs are going to go through the roof because these aren't, you smoke, you die of a heart attack like that, or you get, in six months, you're dead of lung cancer. It's good for the country. You don't collect your Social Security. But the, these are diseases that are going to have enormous costs. So thin people are going to be paying through the nose for f fat people for generations to come. And next slide. So obesity is going up, as you all know. A third of the kids coming into children's hospital are obese. Next slide. So what are the 10 leading sources of calories in the United States? There are no vitamins and minerals in here. Sugary soft drinks is the leading one, 10 teaspoons of sugar and no nutritive value. Cake, sweet rolls, donuts, pastry. This adds up. Uh, this is a cumulative. Hamburger, cheese, pizza, potato chips, rice, rolls, buns, cheese, cheese bread, beer, french fries. Fry. There's not much nutrient value in all of this. And so we're eating calorie-rich, micronutrient-poor diets. These people are all starving, even though they're fat, because they're not getting their vitamins and minerals. And Poor people tend not to take vitamin pills, so I think they're doing themselves in in lots of ways. Now, part of this is all vision. We haven't proven it in people, but we're working on all of this yet and to find the exact level you need in people. But I think it's going to turn out to be true. Next slide. Are you going to live long enough to do it? I don't know. I'm 77 next week. So. Uh, now, exercise. You need a little exercise, too, you all know. And, uh, so, uh, and, but, so, and uh, it's not just vitamin pills in food. Uh, it's not just vitamin pil uh, pills that'll make you go. You need uh, phenolics and plants, and you need fiber and all these things. But actually, they're all cheap. You could put them all in a bar, which we're doing right now. We're going to do a clinical trial on a bar with everything obese people are lacking. Obese people, when they assay for micronutrients, are at the bottom of the list. It's a surrogate for a bad diet. And next slide. So anyway, life expectancy getting longer, and I think it's going to continue to get longer if everybody's going to get too fat, but that, anyway. There'll be the thin people who live long and the fat people who die. But next slide. This says, relax, I've come for your toaster. And the point of that is you don't want to scare people about thousands of minor hypothetical risks. You want to go after the important things, otherwise you never win the battle. And the public is completely confused now, and what you need to tell them is don't smoke and eat a good diet. Now they know about the smoking, and maybe they vaguely know it, but they don't understand. That's what's really hurting their health. Let's see, is that it? Is that the last slide? Oh, this, uh, I was brought this just to show Henry. Uh, Jim Watson, who likes to throw hand grenades out all the time, on genetic engineering, a very safe technology. Let the Greens walk into the sea. The only person who's been harmed by DNA has been Bill Clinton. <laughs> anyway, uh, Watson, Watson, uh, Watson has a sharp tongue and he, Pulls no punches, but anyway, that's, okay, that's all. Thank you. Thank you very much, Bruce. Um, we have some time for questions. Um, Carl has the microphone, and uh, we ask you just to make questions, no uh, statements or comments, and uh, hold the microphone vertical would, would be of help. Um, so, any questions? There's one in the back there. Follow the question up. Yeah, we sure. to oh. uh, do you see any? Uh, this is addressed to either of the panelists. Do you see any difference, or has there been any testing that shows any difference between taking vitamins and minerals through pills versus getting it naturally in food? I think it's pretty much the same thing. Um, so, I mean, there are a few little. The folic acid you get in the pill isn't the right folic acid. It's an oxidized form, and I think they should probably use a reduced form, which is what it is in plants. But little things like that eventually get ironed out. And the vitamin E you're getting in your pill is 
one isomer and it's got some synthetic things that shouldn't be in there, and we probably should be taking natural body weight. But th those are little blips, and the, they'll eventually get iron. But mostly it's the same. Th there are a few other little uh, anomalies, uh, various kinds of calcium that you might get in a pill are somewhat less accessible than it might be in dairy products. And um, there, there are some uh, forms of vitamin D uh, that need to be converted in the body to an active form. Uh, if you get the precursor, you're unlikely to have uh, an overdose of vitamin D because in the presence of excess, it won't be converted to the active form and those things. But it's pretty much as Bruce says. In, in general, you do just as well with uh, synthetic forms. Can I, I'll say one word about vitamin D. Uh, vitamin D is the sunshine vitamin. You need a half hour of sunshine every day to make your vitamin D. And if you don't make it, you have a higher risk of cancer. And dark-skinned people in tropical climates are fine. Dark skin is developed in racially very different people, southern Indians, New Guinea, Africans, to protect you against all that burning ultraviolet light. But in Sweden, you need to have the whitest skin as possible because you need the vitamin D, and they get so little sunshine. So it's that trade-off. So Swedes who go to Arizona or, or uh, Irish who go off to Australia get melanomas, and uh, Indians and Africans in the United States are all vitamin D deficient. There's a huge, 80% of American blacks are vitamin D deficient. So if you have a dark skin, pop a vitamin D pill because it's been linked to all kinds of things. And the brain is just full of vitamin D receptors. Nobody knows what they're doing, but I suspect it's going to affect the brain too. About the lady right there. Portland, okay. I have a question. Um, both of you both have talked about high fructose corn syrup, and it seems like you have contrasting views about it. Have there been any studies done about corn syrup, high fructose corn syrup, and folic acid and iron, and what the effects of them? One seems to Dr. Thoreau seems to be. Um, pro high fructose corn syrup and Dr. Ames seems to be contrary to it. I'm not, maybe I'm mistaken, but I'm just curious what any studies are done on that. Uh, I, I'm, I'm agnostic about, uh, I, I'm agnostic about high fructose corn syrup. It, it, I just uh, presented it as a, a fact of one of the uh, more common products of, of corn which is uh, very highly um, represented by gene-spliced corn. But uh, it's, uh, as, as Bruce said, it's not, uh, not nutrient-rich. It's calorie-rich. It provides energy, but very little uh, in the way of advantageous cofactors. Um, so, yeah. Uh, there's some evidence that fructose may not be as good for you as Fructose may not be as good for you as glucose, but sucrose, which is what we put in our coffee, is half fructose and half uh, glucose. So it's, but high fructose may not be as uh, <coughs> beneficial as sugar, but uh, it's all due to the government anyway, because of uh, barriers to, uh, to sugar, and uh, so they, uh, people responded and found Made, learn to make high fructose from corn syrup to get around that. Anyway, it's complicated. How about the gentleman right there? <coughs> um, David, Thor uh, no, I'm sorry, uh, Mr. Miller, uh, Dr. Miller, are, are you are you aware of the um, mutant weeds in the state of Iowa that have been uh, out of control? and attributed to the use of Roundup, which has caused the increased use of other pesticides? Uh, no, no, I'm not, but it's not surprising. When, when uh, you know, as, uh, as what should have been evident from uh, Bruce's very elegant talk, uh, nature is very resilient. And when you put pressure, uh, evolutionary pressure, on some organism, it's going to respond in a way that will increase its survival. And so if you have 
Uh, Roundup is a potent herbicide that's very, very widely used, as, as many of you know. Um, when you uh, put pressure on um, uh, weeds or other plants that you're trying to kill, uh, you're going to develop resistance in some uh, proportion of them. And, uh, and then you need to move on to other herbicides. So it's not at all surprising. But the important thing here from the point of view of, of regulation is that this isn't a safety issue of any kind. This is an efficacy issue. Uh, if uh, uh, if you, you, you reap the benefits of Roundup or another herbicide, or for that matter, a pesticide for five years or 10 years before organisms develop resistance to it and decrease its utility, you've still had the benefit of, of all of the uh, agronomic uh, activity that that has made possible. But there isn't a safety issue involved. So even if there are uh, Roundup resistant weeds in, in Iowa moving inexorably toward California, it's just not a big deal, nor is it unexpected. How about the gentleman right there? Requiring the use of additional pesticides, which you're suggesting might take five years to get a feel for? I, I don't know how long it'll take. It depends partly whether it's used properly, how it's used, uh, what the biochemistry is of the various weeds that can construct uh, resistance to it. But it's similar to human antibiotics. Uh, you, you don't withhold the use of antibiotics from people who need them because th their use is going to create resistance eventually. Uh, you, you use them, ju you, these products judiciously in order to prevent <coughs> resistance, but when it occurs, you just have to move on to another substance. Is the, well, you mentioned antibiotics. Is the antibiotic marker genes in all the GMO foods increasing people's resistance to antibiotics? N no, it's not. They're not, they're not clinically important uh, ones. Has, has that been tested? Yes. Uh, FDA studied it when they when these products first came along 15 years ago. How about the gentleman right here in the in the leather jacket? Uh, this is a question probably for either Mr. Uh, Professor Ames or Dr. Miller. Um, Deborah Coons Garcia, Jerry's widow, uh, took her inheritance and rather than open up something like a tie dye uh, organic hemp farm, made a movie called The Future of Food. Uh, which is critical of GMOs and got rave reviews uh, from the rocket scientists at places such as the San Francisco Chronicle. If either of you gentlemen have seen the movie, do you have any critiques of the point she raised in the movie is either wrong, irrelevant, or ignoring other significant countervailing facts? Uh, well, I, I, think, uh, I, I think she ought to stick to downloading songs uh, on, onto her iPod. Uh, it, it's, the, the movie is just silly. It ignores the facts entirely. Uh, and it ignores the, uh, it, it just ignores the science completely. It's, it's an, but it's another one of these kinds of things that uh, feeds the pseudo-controversy that I discussed. Another one is uh, within the past week or two, uh, and Bruce and Giovanna Ames might know about this, there was the premiere of an opera uh, that was an anti-genetic engineering opera in, uh, that premiered in Berkeley. Uh, uh, no, it's no surprise. But, but, uh, but again, the, the, the pseudo-controversy continues to grind on in spite of uh, the kinds of a phenomena that I described in spite of the discriminatory, irreconcilable regulatory policies that I described. Uh, and uh, the, uh, the companies uh, such as Monsanto have not been particularly helpful in uh, dispelling some of these myths and in, in educating the public. They've actually, uh, to a surprising degree, embraced discriminatory excess regulation. Uh, and have made some really injudicious choices in the products that the, they've developed. A good example is the very first veterinary product made with recombinant DNA techniques was bovine growth hormone uh, administered to dairy cows to increase their 
their output. Well, you know, for the very first veterinary product, it might have been a good idea not to tamper with nature's most nearly perfect food, you know, with all the, uh, the symbolism of mother's milk and all that. They could just as easily have developed porcine growth hormone uh, to give us leaner pork that they were working on anyway. So but that's a, a different subject, but it, uh, it illustrates part of the problem that we have all of this pseudo-controversy raging and some of the uh, uninformed resistance to biotech that we do have. The lady right here. How do you feel wait, about... Wait for the mic. Oh. How do you feel about using sugar substitute to save a few calories? Well, I, I'm in favor. <laughs> I'm in favor of it. I, it, the, there, I, I'm more familiar with um, with some of the studies of of the the popular fat substitute, Olestra. I, I'm a great uh, believer personally and uh, an avid consumer of Olestra chips, which have no 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 absorbable fat. And I defy you to that tell. Less nutritive value. <laughs> uh, less nutritive value. That's true. Um, but but if I have uh, one of Bruce's pills along with uh, <laughs> w with a, a bag of chips, I, I'm probably doing okay. But a again, you can uh, uh, you can consume uh, uh, m more chips for the same number of calories, and it's very difficult now to tell the difference between Olestra chips uh, and and real trips chips. But the studies show that uh, p that. In general, uh, people consume the same number of calories. They, they're getting less saturated fat if they eat Olestra chips. But, uh, but they do, uh, if, they're, if they're unaware of what they're eating, they'll just eat more of them uh, and consume the same number of calories. So it's not great for a weight loss diet, but it is pretty good for eating less saturated fat if that's your goal. Henry, you'll just have to eat carrots. <laughs> What's that? Uh, question for Professor Ames. Um, several years ago, when you formed uh, Juvenon to distribute uh, what you call Alcar or alpha L-carnitine, there was very good suggestive evidence that using it in rats made them run mazes better yeah. and maybe increase the lifespan. And now it's been several years yeah. since no, we, then. Uh, we didn't uh, lifespan. It did not. Increase. It did not. But we only tried one dose. We're going to try it again in mice at several Well, doses. that's what I'm getting at. Has there been any further results uh, that show more or less benefit with LCAR in the animals? And are there any data in humans whatsoever? Oh, yeah. In humans, uh, the company just had a successful clinical trial on hypertension. It lowers blood pressure. And uh, in rats, it seems to lower triglycerides, so we're going to do a test on that. Anyway, uh, the company has 5,000 uh, unsolicited emails from customers all raving about it, and 25 saying they got a side effect, almost all rashes. The side effects are very minor. And uh, so a lot of people say they just feel a lot better. I didn't feel any difference myself, but I'm pretty happy. <laughs> About the gentleman right here. Could you perhaps uh, pick up? No problem. Oh, you're right. I don't need it. <laughs> we need it. No, we need it. Could you pick out one of your major ideas that you think are important and comment on how you think it's penetrating the United States and the marketplace of ideas, or how you feel, or if you're if you're disappointed, or happy, or excited, or how that's going? That's a big question. I know. Well, I, I'm a chronic pessimist. I, I'm never happy about public policy. Uh, and uh, every time, um, ev virtually every time I bet on uh, regulatory agencies to do the wrong thing, I win. Um, FDA, where I spent 15 years, is having terrible problems and doing worse all the time and um, becoming more risk averse uh, all the time. Um, EPA, which Bruce has mentioned a number of times, uh, I think, um, and I may under, understate when I say this, may be the worst regulatory agency in the history of the world. Uh, just relentless corruption, stupidity, uh, anti-science, anti-ideology, anti-science ideology inside. Uh, EPA really sees science as something 
to be manipulated for their own bureaucratic advantages. Um, so, uh, but I, I think the, um, uh, the, the many uh, palpable benefits of, of ag and food biotech uh, are beginning to, uh, uh, to take hold. And uh, we're seeing great successes in places like India and China, uh, and uh, not only benefits to farmers, but public health benefits and use of less agricultural chemicals and um, more, f more favorable uh, agricultural practices such as no-till farming, which uh, decreases ero soil erosion. So I, I think we're, we're seeing some um, medium-term and, and long-term advantages becoming visible there. On the other hand, um, more than 99% of the um, huge amount of cultivation that I described, and we just passed the billionth acre milestone of, of cultivation of gene spliced plants, more than 99% of that is for large-scale commodity crops, uh, corn, cotton, canola, and soy. And uh, until we start to see it for other things, um, uh, lettuce, broccoli, carrots, whatever, whatever they are, and, uh, and especially uh, moving into, diffusing into subsistence crops, sorghum, uh, millet, and so on, um, where a little bit of uh, enhanced nutritional value can go a very, very long way for people who are on subsistence diets. Uh, I don't think we're going to see anything near the potential realized for, for ag biotech. But, well, I'm an optimist, and uh, Henry's a pessimist, and uh, it's awful, but it, uh, the world's moving along. It's always two steps forward, one step back. Uh, I mean, when you look, I mean, every intellectual in the world believed in something crazy. Uh, 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 they were all socialist at one point, and that led to a mess. And then, you know, uh, that's how life is. People are nutty. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, my question concerns um, uh, perspective that perhaps various sections of the public have uh, towards science. For instance, there seems to be something called cultural wars that that are surfacing or resurfacing uh, now in terms of, let's say, evolution versus cre uh, uh, the intelligent design or, or some, some uh, facet thereof. Do you think this uh, and the politics that derive from this are impacting the regulatory agencies that you speak of that uh, in, in many ways hamper uh, science, such as gene splicing or things of that sort now, that, that uh, really, maybe compared to other Western countries, uh, the United States has a internal problem, maybe more so than <coughs> might exist in some of the other Western countries concerning biological sciences. I think we're better off than Europe. Europe is drowning in regulation, and uh, so, you know, you don't expect regulatory agencies to work. The monopolies and their incentives are perverse, so their main incentive is to metastasize, and they do that very well. So, yeah, the, the agency, uh, you have to keep, remember that, the agency, you have to get used to the fact that the agencies exist and are supported by interest groups that use them for their own purposes. Yeah. Big, company, and, big industry right. likes regulatory exactly. agencies, then they don't get competed, then, then small companies can't compete right. with that's, them. That's the source of the problem. Yeah. Right um, it's been a well-known, well-documented, there's been a revolving door of executives uh, from Monsanto working at the USDA. So how come there's a problem with a morass of regulations when regulatory uh, regulations when they are running when Santa the USDA. Likes regulation because then the little guys don't compete with it. All the big companies can spend uh, to get a drug through FDA is what close to a billion dollars now, and the big companies like that because they have the teams, the lawyers, and the little companies can't compete. That's it, what it, it does. Bruce is right. In the Reagan administration, when, when I was in the government, Monsanto came in and asked for excessive process-based regulation, partly uh, to uh, pre prevent seed companies and s startup biotech companies from being able to compete with them, uh, and partly, perhaps, because they thought it would assuage the, uh, 
the objections of some of the activists, which of course didn't happen. Um, but uh, uh, the, the big companies have been a problem all along. And as a result, we now have about five major ag biotech companies uh, compared to several dozen 20 years ago. The, uh, the, the model to keep in mind is many drug and food companies view the FDA as a, uh, a public utility regulatory body that they then have to utilize uh, to socialize their risk and liability and to exclude competition. That's, that's, that kind of mindset is, is the problem, I think, and uh, people believing that it somehow is actually improving the situation. Uh, one more question. How about the lady right here? Dr. Ames, there was a wonderful article in Alternative Medicine about, I think, six months ago on your theory of the devastation wrought by the lack of one essential macronutrient, micronutrient, and you again said 40. What are the 40? Where can we learn what the 40 are? I once, oh. ma I once made a list, and I lost it, but I'll make it. <laughs> <laughs> I'll make, they're the uh, essential amino acids, the essential vitamins, all the minerals that you require, omega-3 fatty acids, oxygen, I don't know, they're, they're all these ingredients, uh, oxygen is going to be a micronutrient. Yeah, I have a website, but I don't have that up on it. I, um, I'll what put it in website? a paper sometime. Uh, what is my website? Uh, what is, uh, Bruce, you can put it in uh, BruceAmes.org, I think. Bruce, you can put it in that book we've been talking about. Yeah. Let's see, I have a, a sheet. I, I never look at my website. Yeah. Yeah, I think that might have it. I have a handout if anybody wants it, and it might have my website. So it's my email. Um, I'm, this discussion obviously can, can and will continue. I want to thank uh, Dr. Ames and Dr. Miller for their wonderful work and their presentations. And um, the book, The Franken Food Myth, is upstairs. For those of you who don't have copies, I highly recommend it. Uh, Henry would be delighted to autograph copies for anyone who would like. Um, and thank you for joining with us. We look forward to your being here the next time. Good night.